I hope that you've taken a break because you can only do so many related rates problems before your brain just says, I'm done. So hopefully you've had a break and you're now ready to start fresh and take a look at the last five examples in the related rates section. Some of these are quite difficult, either in their solving or in their setup. So I hope again that you are rested and ready to go. Let's take a look at example seven. An inverted conical water tank with a height of 12 feet and a radius of six feet is drained through a hole in the vertex here at the bottom at a rate of two cubic feet per second. What is the rate of change of the water depth when the water depth is three feet? Okay, well, I know I've got a cone and I know that I've got water and that's really all I got, but that's enough. Let's go back and break it apart in step two. An inverted conical water tank. If you didn't already have a picture of a conical water tank, you should draw one now. It should look like this first picture on the left. With a height of 12 feet, stop and make note of that. The height, which is here, I'll use uppercase H, is 12 feet. Because I know that the height of a water tank can't change. So I know that's going to stay 12 feet no matter what. And a radius of six feet. Okay, the radius of the water tank uppercase R, is always going to be a constant six feet. I can't change the metal of the water thing. It is drained through a hole in the vertex. This might not be on purpose. We might be trying to measure the size of the leak. Through a hole in the vertex at a rate of two cubic feet per second. Look at the units and tell me what variable you think that represents. That's right, that must be the change in volume with respect to time. Well, if there is water dripping out of the bottom and we started with water up here, what's it going to look like at a later point in time? At a later point in time, I have the same shape with the same height, but my water level is lower. That means that the volume is decreasing. So dv dt should be a negative two cubic feet per second. Now let's look at the last question. What is the rate of change derivative of the water depth, the water depth. Well, if I look at my before and after picture, I can use the lowercase letter h to represent the depth of the water in each one. And you can tell that h is decreasing as the water drips out the bottom. Because the height is dropping, then I'm looking for a negative rate of change. I want to find this when the water depth, the height, is three feet. I won't be able to plug in the three feet until the end because I know the height is changing. Now I'm expecting dh dt to be negative. All right, well, I need to relate h and the volume. The problem is I cannot use the radius of the tank because the radius in the volume formula is the radius of the current height of the water level. In other words, the radius is also changing. The radius represents from here to the edge, and I can use a lowercase r to represent that value. 
As the water level drops, the radius is also decreasing. We're not given any information about the rate of change of the radius, just the rate of change of the height and the volume. Well, let's go ahead and write a relating equation and then think about how we could maybe come up with some formula to rewrite the radius in terms of the height. Our relating equation is going to come from the volume. Again, as in the previous example, the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared times the height. But I cannot eliminate the r and the h, and I don't yet know the relationship between them. In this problem, we're going to use a technique called similar triangles. This is actually coming from geometry. When you look at this large water tank, you can actually create a right triangle from various measures. The right triangle that we're creating comes down through the center to the vertex along one of the slanted sides and then back in again to the center of the top. This gives us a right triangle, which you can see drawn here in the middle. The line at the top represents the radius of the water tank, which never changes. The radius of the water tank is six feet. This little r down here represents the radius of the current height of the water. Again, the top of the water there will be a circle and it has a radius, but this is changing. So I cannot represent it with a value. Now the height of the entire triangle is uppercase h, which I know is again 12 feet. I don't know the height of the water, but it would be this amount right here. What I need to do now is relate two triangles and prove that they're similar to each other. Similar triangles have proportional side lengths. I have two right triangles within that large triangle. Let's take a look and I'll highlight them for you now. The first one is the large one, which again goes from the top center of the water tank to the vertex and then along a slanted side. Another one instead goes just the depth of the water to the vertex up the same slanted side and across the radius of the top of the water. In both cases, these are right triangles. That means they share that angle. Oops, I unplugged myself. What else does it mean? Well, I know that they share the angle at the bottom at the vertex. So if they have a right angle and the same angle at the bottom, then two of the three angles in the triangle are equal. Because the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180 degrees, I know that this third angle must also be equal. That means that the triangles, while not same in size, not congruent, are similar. What can I write about a similar triangle? We're going to come over here to the side and we're going to write some information about our similar triangles. I'm trying to come up with a relationship to get rid of the radius of the water level, the lowercase r. So I'm going to start with lowercase r and compare it to the height of the water, lowercase h. Because the triangles are similar, the radius of the water tank, uppercase r, should have the same ratio to the height of the water tank, uppercase h. 
Now I know that the radius of the water tank and height of the water tank are constants. So I can replace those with what they are equal to. This tells me that lowercase r divided by lowercase h is equal to six feet divided by 12 feet, which equals the ratio one half. Now I can solve for the variable r in terms of h to get that the radius must be half of the height. Now that I have a relationship, I can replace the R in the relating equation with that representation. That will give me a relating equation that only relates volume to height. Make sure when you square that you square both the constant and the variable. This is going to give me pi over three times h squared over four times h, which gives me pi over 12 h cubed. You know what to do from here, so go ahead and do it and turn the video back on. After you have the relating equation, Go ahead and take the derivative of both sides using the chain rule. We end up with dv dt equal to pi over 4 h squared dh dt after we simplify. Now that we have taken the derivative of the relating equation, we're ready to substitute the values. The value of dv dt is negative 2 cubic feet per second, and the height is 3 feet. We're looking for dh dt, so we have nothing to substitute for that value. After we multiply it out and then multiply by the reciprocal of the coefficient of dh dt, we end up with a rate of change of height with respect to time of negative 8 divided by 9 pi feet per second. Note that the units, feet, match height and seconds matches time. I also expected, based on my picture, that the height was dropping because the water level is dropping, because the water is dripping out the bottom. And I got a negative rate of change, so my answer is reasonable. Let's move on to the next example, number eight. Number eight is a relatively straightforward example compared to some of the ones we've done. That doesn't mean it's easy. No related rates problem is easy. I want you to try this one completely on your own. So pause the video now, give it a shot, and then we'll compare. Let's look at our work. The glass never changes shape, so the radius is a constant two inches. The height of the glass is a constant six inches, but the height of the soda in the water is dropping. DH dt is negative 0.25 inches per second or negative one inch per four seconds. How do we measure the change in the soda? Well, soda is measured in liters or ounces, which is a measure of volume. So we're trying to find the change in volume. It doesn't ask at a particular point in time. I can tell the volume is decreasing, so I expect a negative. Because the glass doesn't change shape, the volume is given by the volume of a cylinder, pi r squared a. I replace the radius with the constant two inches since that never changes. Radius is not changing from the before to the after. Then I take my relating equation and I apply the derivative operation. Next, I substitute the value for the rate of change of the height or depth of the soda at that point. This gives me a final solution of negative pi cubic inches per second. Inches per second cubed 
is the right amount for the change in volume with respect to time. Negative makes sense since the volume is decreasing. This one is relatively short and compared to the others, a bit less complicated. This next problem, example nine, is likewise very short, but it is very complicated. In my experience, students have a great deal of difficulty even getting started on this equation. So we'll do this one together. A fisherman hooks a trout and begins turning her circular wheel, this is a reel, at 1.5 revolutions per second, meaning she goes around once and another half turn every second. If the radius of the reel and the fishing line on it is two inches, how fast is she reeling in her fishing line? Now, we're playing a little fast and loose here, because as she reels in the line, it adds fishing line onto it. So the radius is actually changing, but we're going to assume it stays a constant two inches because fishing line is very, very thin. And it won't add a measurable amount to the radius, at least for our purposes. Now, let's go back and break it down. A fisherman, got it. Hooks a trap. Oh, well, uh, I need a pole. So I'm going to have to have a pole coming off my fishing rod and dangling from the pole, I have wire. And at the end of the wire, I have a fish. I told you, I can't draw. I know it looks like my airplane. Now what happens? She begins to reel in the fish by pulling the fishing line back onto the reel by making rotations. She's turning her circular reel at 1.5 revolutions per second. 1.5 revolutions per second. Well, that's the rate of change of the revolutions with respect to time. I don't know exactly how to represent that, so I'm simply going to write the change in the revolutions with respect to time is equal to 1.5 revolutions per second. The reel goes around one full time and another half time every second. If the radius of the reel and the fishing line on it is two inches, a constant two inches, since I did not tell you how thick the fishing line was, I can write R equals two inches. How fast velocity is the change in length with respect to time? Is she reeling in her fishing line? What is it that's getting shorter? It's the length of the line. So how fast is the change in the length of the fishing line? I'm looking for the L dt. The length is getting shorter, so I expect that this will come up um, negative. We'll have to see if this works out. It may not come out negative, in which case we know it should be negative, so we'll simply apply the negative. Now we have a problem. Revolutions isn't related to the length. The length is measured in inches. But revolutions is the number of times I make a circle. So how can I relate the two? Well, I'm going to have to relate them by relating them to the circumference of the reel. Every time I go around one revolution, I've gone one circumference of the reel. The circumference of the reel is 2 pi r, where r is the radius. Since the radius is 2 inches, this tells me that the circumference is four pi inches. Every time I make a revolution, I've reeled in another four pi inches. One revolution 
shortens the fishing line by four pi inches. In that case, I can find the revolutions and the length of the line by multiplying my two pi r by the length. That will give me the length of the line. The circumference of the reel times the number of revolutions. I know that the radius never changes, so I can write this instead as four pi inches times the number of revolutions. I know the rate of change of revolutions, so I'm ready to now take the derivative of both sides. My relating equation is L equals four pi inches times the number of revolutions. My derivative will give me dl dt. And on the other side, I get four pi inches d revolutions dt. Then I substitute for the value of the rate of change of the Such revolutions. That tells me that dl dt is going to come out to be six pi inches per second. There are a couple of things to note about this particular problem. First, I drop the units of revolutions. Revolutions is sort of a pseudo unit like radians that can be put in when it's needed and taken out when it's not. You'll also notice that this came up positive I didn't make note that the revolutions were going backwards in order to reel the line in. My change in revolutions should have been negative to correspond to the fact that I'm reeling the line in and not letting the line out. If I make that change, then I will get the negative I was expecting. If you don't set it up that way, I'm fine with you simply making the change at the end, but you do need to recognize that the length is decreasing, so it should be negative. I don't really expect my students to understand that the change in revolutions has to be negative to pull the line in, but now that you've seen it, I hope that you will remember it. We're going to move on now to example number 10, the most difficult one, I think, in the whole set. Example 10, I think, is probably the most difficult of all the related rates problems. I certainly would not give this on an exam because I think it's too complicated and too long. Let's go ahead and read it now. The hands of the clock in the Tower of the Houses of Parliament in London are approximately three meters and two and a half meters in length. How fast is the distance between the tips of the hands changing at nine o'clock? The hint is to use the law of cosines. First off, you need to recognize that this is not a digital clock, it's analog. Let's draw a picture of a before and an after. The clock face will not change size, so I'm going to have the same size clock face. I want to know what happens at nine. Let's go back and read. The hands of the clock, got it, in the tower of the houses of parliament, in London, all great information, but not mathematical. R, got it, approximately three meters and 2.5 meters in length. They don't tell you which is which, but you know that the minute hand is longer than the hour hand. I don't know where to position the hands yet, so I'm simply gonna write minute hand equals three meters our hand equals 2.5 meters. 
how fast, okay, I'm looking for a rate of change, is the distance between the tips of the hands, got it, changing at nine o'clock. That means I have before nine o'clock and at nine o'clock. We'll draw the picture of at nine o'clock first, since it's probably easier. At nine o'clock, the minute hand is longer and points straight up to 12. And the hour hand, which is shorter, well, I need to make it obviously shorter, points horizontally to the left to nine. The tips of the hands are at the ends of the arrows. So the distance that we're interested in is the distance between their tips. We don't want to use D because we're gonna be taking derivatives, but S is often used for distance. So let's let S equal the distance between the tips of the hands. Now, many students want to go ahead and immediately use the Pythagorean theorem. That is not the rate of change of the distance at that point in time. Remember, you cannot substitute values until you have taken the derivative of the relating equation. Let's look at what the clock looks like before it strikes nine o'clock. Before nine o'clock, the hour hand is between the eight and the nine, approaching the nine. The minute hand is between 11 and 12, approaching 12. But the angle between these two is not 90 degrees. It only hits 90 degrees at that one instant in time. The distance between the tips then is given again by the blue line connecting, oops, and blue, connecting the tips of the arrows. And it pumped me off my page. Okay. From here to here. I need to write an equation that relates S to the lengths of the air of the hands. But because it's not a right triangle, I cannot use the Pythagorean theorem. This is where the law of cosines comes into play. I've drawn pictures and I have everything down, but I haven't yet written down what I'm looking for. The last thing I'm looking for is how fast the distance between the tips of the hands is changing at nine. In other words, I'm trying to find ds dt at nine o'clock. I don't really have an expectation, except I think it probably is decreasing. I think that it's closer together at nine than it was just before nine. So I think it will be decreasing, but I'm not 100% sure. I need a relating equation, so I use the law of cosines. Remember that the law of cosines is given by a squared equal b squared plus c squared minus 2bc times the cosine of the angle across from side A. We want the angle to be the angle between the hands. That will be our angle A. S then is our A. S squared has to be equal to the length of the hour hand and the minute hand, each squared. Those lengths are three meters squared and two and a half meters squared. Those lengths will not change throughout the problem. So I can go ahead and put those values in now. They are not changing length from the before and after picture. The cosine, I'm gonna write theta for the angle here between the two hands. Now go ahead and simplify this equation. 
what we'll need to do next is find the derivative of the relating equation. If you simplify the equation, you will eventually get to this following expression. S squared is given by 15.25 meters squared minus 15 meters squared times the cosine of theta. This is our relating equation. Now we take the derivative of the relating equation. I applied the um, quotient or chain rule on both sides. And this gives me 2s ds dt equal zero minus 15 meters squared times negative sine of theta. But theta does not match t. So I also have a d theta dt. The double negative will make it positive. And I can then write that 2s the s dt is equal to 15 meters squared sine of theta d theta dt. The problem is, I don't know d theta dt. I was not given d theta dt. How can I figure that out? We need to do some more thinking about the relationship between the minute hand and the hour hand and how that angle is changing. I don't know anything about the rate of change of the angle between the hands, but I do know something about the rate of change of the minute hand as it goes around the clock and the hour hand as it goes around the clock. For the minute hand, I know that the rate of change of the angle with respect to time for the minute hand is going to be given by two pi radians, it goes all the way around, every one hour. In other words, it traces out one circle every one hour. What about the hour hand? Well, the hour hand goes all the way around the circle, not in one um, hour, but in 12 hours. It makes a revolution of two pi radians every 12 hours. I can write down their rates of change. Now I've got to figure out how to relate those two to the rate of change of the angle between the two. Let's think about it. Let's look back at our clock and visualize what's happening. The minute hand and the hour hand are rotating clockwise. The minute hand is moving away from the hour hand, which would make theta larger. That means that it must be positive. However, the hour hand is moving towards the minute hand, which would make theta smaller, which must mean it's negative. The rate of change of the angle between the two hands, d theta dt, is given by the difference between the rates of change of the minute hand and the hour hand. Notice that the radians can be put in and taken out. You need to get a common denominator and combine them together. When you do, you're going to get 11 pi radians every six hours. This is the rate of change of the angle theta with respect to time. Now that we have this, we can replace our d theta dt with this expression. And all that's left is to replace theta and s at that point in time. What would theta be right at nine o'clock? Yes, it would be pi over two. So the sine of pi over two would give me one. How are you going to find s right at nine o'clock? Let's look at the picture to help us figure it out. 
right at nine o'clock, this becomes a right triangle. So you can use the Pythagorean theorem. Go ahead and finish the problem now, then turn the video back on and we'll compare our answers. Let's now go ahead and complete this complicated problem. We found our relating equation and took the derivative of it. The relating equation came from the law of cosines. When we took the derivative and simplified, we got the relationship two times the distance times the rate of change of distance equals 15 square meters times the sine of theta times the rate of change of theta with time. We computed the rate of change of theta with time to be an 11 pi radians over six hours, meaning that at this point, in fact, the angle must be getting larger since the rate of change is positive. Now what we want to do is we want to substitute our values into this formula. Let's go ahead and turn to the next page where I've completed this work. When we look at this page, the relating equation after we've done the derivative is at the top. We know that at precisely nine o'clock, theta for one instant becomes pi over two or 90 degrees. So the sine of theta becomes one. We know the rate of change of theta is a positive 11 pi radians every six hours. That means that we can replace d theta dt and sine of theta with what they represent. However, we also have an s in the equation. Right at nine o'clock, we need to find the distance between the tip of the minute hand and the hour hand. But at nine o'clock, that triangle is something that we can use the Pythagorean theorem on because it's a right triangle. That means that we can write the distance squared is equal to three meters squared plus two and a half meters squared. When we work it out, we end up with the distance between the hands at that one precise instant in time as the square root of 15.25, and it becomes meters. This is about four meters, a little bit less. We use the exact value to replace in the relating equation after we've done the derivative. When we work it out and solve for the rate of change of the distance with respect to time, we get 55 pi meters divided by four radical 15.25 hours. The units, meters per hour, do meet our expectations for the rate of change of distance with respect to time. This is about 3.52 pi meters per hour, which is a rate of change of 11.06 meters per hour. In fact, it turns out that the distance is getting larger at this point in time. So in fact, the rate of change of distance is positive, which is not what I expected. But again, I wasn't sure at the beginning because I wasn't exactly sure what was happening. When I think about it now, it does make sense because they will continue to get further apart until the minute hand is 180 degrees from the hour hand, and then the angle will get smaller again. We have one example left to do, which is another complicated example, number 11. We're going to work this one together as well, at least up to a point. A swimming pool is 50 meters long and 20 meters wide. Its depth decreases linearly along the length from three meters to one meter. It is initially empty and is filled at a rate of one cubic meter per minute. How fast is the water level rising 250 minutes after the filling begins? How long will it take to fill the pool? This one is an interesting problem in that we've got two shapes put together. Let's talk about those shapes. I have a couple of props to help me to represent this swimming pool for you. 
first, the bottom of the pool is shaped like a wedge, like this binder that you see here. It's going to be thicker at the deep end of the pool and coming up to horizontal at the front. The top of the pool is a rectangle, which is sitting on top of the pool. So we have a rectangular box on top of a triangular wedge. This is the shape of the pool. We need to know what rate of change of the water level is after we begin filling. The water will have to first fill the rectangular shape on the bottom before, or the wedge shape, um, rectangle on top, but a triangle on the sides. It's going to have to fill the wedge first before it even starts to fill the upper rectangular box of the swimming pool. Let's go ahead and break this problem down and take a look at how we can find a relating equation. A swimming pool, got the picture already, is 50 meters long. It's marked on the picture that the length of the pool is 50 meters and 20 meters wide. This is marked as well. Its depth decreases linearly in a straight line along the length from three meters to one meter. At the deep end of the pool, it is nine meters deep, which is about, or nine, about nine feet, three meters. And then it comes up along this wedge to be one meter deep at the shallow end, about three feet. Let's draw what the side view of this swimming pool would look like. On the side view, we have this rectangular box on top of this triangular wedge. We know that the distance from the very top to the very bottom is three meters. We know that the depth in the shallow end of the pool is one meter, which tells me, of course, that this depth must be two meters. Didn't quite get to the bottom, did I? All right. I know that the length of the pool is 50 meters, which must represent this measure here. I can't see the width of the pool, the 20 meters, because it's extending into the screen. But this is the situation that I have. Now that I've drawn the pictures for the first two sentences, it's time to start the second or third. It is initially empty. There's no water in the pool. It is filled at a rate of one cubic meter per minute. The units tell us this must be the change in volume. This is going to give me dV dt equal to uh, one cubic meter per minute. Because the volume of water in the pool is increasing, I know it should be positive. How fast rate of change is the water level rising? Water level. Well, I don't have a water level yet. Let's do a water level one and a water level two. I don't know whether at time one, it's gonna be here and time two here or what the situation is. Actually, I guess I do know. At the beginning, it's empty. And later in time, we'll do this in pink. Well, I don't know where the height of the water is. Is it still in the triangular piece or is it up above in the rectangular piece? This is kind of a question mark. But I know that I can measure the depth of the water and call it H. H is going to change so I can't substitute for it until after I've taken the derivative of the relating equation. Again, I don't actually know if the water level later is here in the triangular bottom or if it's up here at the top of the pool in the rectangular part. I want to find how fast the water level is rising, which is dH dt, at a particular point in time. I want dH dt 
250 minutes after the pool begins to fill. The next question is, how long will it take to fill the pool? Well, that's time. I guess I could write T equals time to fill. That is not a rate of change. That's just a simple variable. Now what I want to do is I want to be able to figure out whether I'm in this bottom triangular region or if I'm up here. Why? Because the volume formula is going to change depending on where I am. I need to know if I filled that triangular piece at some point in the first 250 minutes. What is the volume of this piece down here? There are a couple of ways of figuring this out. Remember that this is a wedge shape with a depth of two meters on this side coming up to a point on the other. It is going to be a right triangle. And we do know that this measure here is 50. We also know that it is 20 meters wide. So we can find the volume of this regular solid by taking the area of the triangular base and multiplying by the distance between the two triangular ends, which is the width of the pool. Let's go ahead and write that formula down now. I'm simply trying to compute the volume of the bottom space so I know whether or not it's been filled in the first 250 minutes. I'm going to find the area of the triangle and I'm gonna multiply by the 20 meters that it is wide. We'll also discuss another way to do it. The area of that triangle is one half the 50 meters times the two meters deep that it is, times the 20 meters. Note that the units do become cubic meters. When I multiply this out, let's see, what do I come up with? This gives me 200, no, it does not. It gives me 1,000 cubic meters. All right, I filled 1,000 cubic meters. Now, the question is, how many minutes did it take to do that? Have I finished filling the bottom in 250 minutes? It's filling at a rate of one cubic meter every minute. In five minutes, I have five cubic meters. To get a thousand cubic meters, I would have to have a thousand minutes. And they want me to find dhdt when time is 250, which means that the water level is still in this bottom wedge shape. Now I said there's another way to compute the volume of the bottom. You could think of the wedge as half of a rectangular box, which is 50 meters wide, or 20 meters wide, 50 meters long, and two meters deep. The wedge is half of that rectangular box. That gives you the same representation, of course. We know it'll take a thousand minutes to fill the bottom. So we need to set up our formula to relate the change in volume and the H referring only to the bottom wedge shaped section. In this case, we can compute the volume by looking at the volume of the water. When we look at the volume of the water, notice that the triangle is smaller. What we now have is a triangle that goes from here down a length of H and then up along the slanted side. However, this is similar to the entire deep end of the pool, which is the whole wedge shape. Notice that they share this angle here at the bottom end of the pool, and they both have a right angle, which means all three angles must be the same. This angle and this angle must be equivalent. This means I can use, you got it, similar triangles. 
Now what can I write? I want to be able to represent this. So I need to figure out what this link right here is. I don't have a name for it yet, so I need a name inside of my picture. I'll call this L. Now, when I'm looking at this, the volume of the water will be given by a similar equation to what we did to compute the volume of the entire wedge shape deep in, but instead with L and H substituted inside. So now I want to find the volume of the water. This is going to be the area of that triangle, which is one half L times H times the width of the pool, which has not changed. It's still 20 meters. This tells me the volume of the water is equal to 10 meters L H. Now I'm looking for dH dt and I have dV dt. I don't know anything about L. I'm going to use the similar triangles that we identified here with highlighting to be able to rewrite L in terms of H so I can get my relating equation just in terms of the volume and the height. Let's go ahead and write down what the relationship is. When I look at these, L corresponds to the 50 meters and H corresponds to the two meters, not three. Make sure you're just using the wedge shape at the bottom. I can write L over H equals 50 meters over two meters. 50 meters over two meters reduces to give me 25. Solving for L, I get L equals 25 H. Now I'm going to substitute that back into my equation that relates the volume to that length and the depth of the water. When I do that, I get a new relating equation. My new relating equation is going to be volume of the water equal to 10 meters times 25 H times another H, which is 250 meters H squared. Now that I have a relating equation, I'm ready to take the derivative. This one is relatively straightforward for taking the derivative. So let's go ahead and do it now. This will give me dv of the water, dt, equal 500 meters h times dh dt. All right, now that I have the derivative of the relating equation, I'm ready to substitute. The problem is I need to know what the height is at this point in time. And I don't have that yet. I also need dH dt, except that's what I'm looking for. Do I have dV dt? I believe we were given dV dt as one cubic meter per minute. How can we figure out what the depth of the water is at 250 minutes? At 250 minutes, I know for a fact that the volume of water in the pool is 250 cubic meters because the rate of change is one cubic meter per minute. I think it was minute. That means this side is 250, and then I can solve for H. The volume of the water at 250 minutes is 250. That looks more like a six um, cubic meters. Then I get 250 cubic meters equal to 250 meters times H squared. Dividing both sides by 250 M, I get one M squared equals H squared. Then I can take the derivative. I'm realizing that the 
depth of the water must be non-negative, I know that I end up with one meter. At that point in time, the depth of the water is one meter. Now I know everything I need to know to find dH dt. Let's go ahead and substitute these values into our equation so that we can find dH dt. dV of the water dt is going to be one meter cubed per minute equals 500 meters times the height, which we found to be one meter, times dH dt, which is what we're looking for. This gives me one cubic meter per minute equal to 500 square meters times the rate of change of the depth of the water. Multiplying by the reciprocal, I end up with the following equation. Notice that the meter squared cancels two of the meters cubed so that I end up with finally dH dt is one over 500 meters per minute. This makes sense that it would be positive because the water is getting deeper and it's increasing at a relatively low rate. This was the first part that we were looking at here. The question is, what's the second part? The next part that we're looking for was the time it takes to fill it. I know that the bottom of the pool has a thousand cubic meters. That will take 1000 minutes for the bottom of the pool. How many minutes will it take to fill the top? Well, that depends on the volume in the top. Let's go back to our picture and compute the volume of the rectangular top piece. The top piece is 20 meters wide, 50 meters long, and one meter deep. When you multiply those together, that gives you another 1,000 cubic meters. Since it fills one cubic meter per minute, the top is also going to take 1,000 minutes. This means that the total time to fill the pool is 2,000 minutes. I know this is a difficult and very long section. The homework is gonna take probably twice as long as in the other section. Expect to spend a lot of time here because these problems are long and complicated. You'll be happy to hear that in the next video, we'll be looking at linear approximations and differentials, which are very calculations-based and relatively straightforward compared to related rates. That will be a much shorter section and far easier than what we've done here. I hope to see you there in the next video.